So she asked me, what's your story with dead bodies? And I said, well, that's going to be a short one. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the person, you know the people that always know the person that jumped off the bridge or got hit by the bus or died of a freak infection in the hospital? It's not me. Um, the first time I knew somebody that died, I was 20, and I was living in Paris, and um, I had the idea to go over to London to see my friend Jenny Carr, and she was a friend of the family, and when she was in America, people would ask her what she was doing, and she'd say, oh, I just hopped over, <laughs> and I thought, like she just walked through a hedgerow. <laughs> and um, so I thought, well, I'm in Paris. I'll just pop over to London. So I did. I took two trains and the ferry, and I got up from the London Underground, and I walked into one of those red phone booths, and I dialed Jenny's number, and it rang and rang. And it occurred to me at that moment that popping over might entail a phone call. <laughs> and I thought, well, what am I going to do? And finally somebody answered the phone. It was a woman. And I said, Jenny, it's Lindsay from America. I'm here. And there was silence. Bill Lane's daughter. I'm here in London. And then there was fumbling. And then another woman got on the phone. And she said, Lindsay, this is Jenny's mom. She died yesterday of a brain injury. And um, then she asked me if I was okay. And if I had a place to stay. And I don't remember what I said back. I hung up the phone. And all I could remember right now is um, that it was red. And I could hear Phoebe Snow's voice in my head. And she's singing that song. It starts, Oh, mommy, mommy. Oh, mommy, mommy. After that, the n there weren't a lot of other dead people. I mean, my grandparents died, but I never ever saw their dead bodies. And then, um, two years ago, my sister called and she said, she said that um, my mom had stopped eating and that it would be about 10 days or two weeks. She'd gone into hospice about two months before that. And so I flew up there to be with her. And um, when somebody's dying like that, you give them morphine to stop the pain. And what's odd about morphine is that it's not medicine. You know, usually it's always, you know, you give them medicine and they get well, but morphine just keeps them kind of in a half-life. And I knew that every time we increase the dosage that she was moving further out on the coil. And, um, but at certain points during those 10 days that I was there, she'd look, she'd kind of get out of the haze and she'd look at us and she'd say, let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember she would say that to us when the service was really bad in a restaurant. <laughs> and another time she came out of the haze and now this is a woman that was not moving much and she sat up and she said, Betty Lane, Westfield, Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> but I said to my sister, well, she's checked into the afterlife, I'm sure. <laughs> and um, <laughs> after about 10 days, I had to get home because I'm a single mom. And it was time to get home to be with my daughter. And I knew that my mom would understand because being a mom is her entire life. So I kissed her goodbye. And... Um, Two days later, my sister called, and she said, um, her breathing's really bad. It's rattly. Um, do you think it would be all right if I gave her some lorazepam? And 
And I knew she was asking me if it'd be all right if I if she helped her die. And I said, of course. That's what she did for us. And about an hour later, she died. And um, my daughter said, but Mom, it's July 4th. It's the coolest day of the year to die. <laughs> So that was two years ago, still no dead bodies, and then um, my daughter and I came home one night last January, and our dog, Bear Cub, um, he greeted us with his head really cooked around and his back legs fallen behind him, and um, we took him to the vet, and they said he'd had a stroke, and you could give him this medicine, and he could possibly get well. He was 12, big dog, but maybe. So we started the medicine, and, um, okay, this is my first time with a dying body, and it's awful. It's puke and pee and poop and cleaning up, and it's a lot. And, and what's really awful about that is that there's this voice in your head saying, I love this person, this thing, this animal, but this is icky. I don't like this. And you kind of have this other voice in your head going, I wish something would happen. I wish you'd go, and then you feel bad because then you know you're not this selfless, angelic being you thought you were. <laughs> So I said to Bear Cub, okay, if you do that pawing thing where you want somebody to pet you, I'll know. I'll know that you want to keep living and I'm on the right path here. I mean, he didn't do it to me. He did it to some friend that came by. I thought, well, shit, what did that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the vet again. Now this requires picking him up and carrying him out. He's a lab Rottweiler. And on the fifth trip to the vet for the shot, he finally nipped the vet, and I said, okay, we're done with the vet. We're done with the shot. And um, I'm driving home, and I decide that I'm going to stop and see my friend Lou. I don't know why. But I stop to see my friend Lou, and he comes out to the car to say hello to Bear Cub, and Lou takes one look at me, and he says, why are you keeping him alive? And then I went into a big whine. Because, Lou, you know, I feel like if I don't, that means I'm lazy and then I'm, I'm letting him down and maybe he wants to live and it's just, I'm just not doing the, I, I'm giving up if I don't keep doing it. And he says to me, Lindsay, guilt is a roll lock. You cannot make a free choice with shoulds and have to. <laughs> so I went home, and it was the weekend, it was rainy and cold, and every time I took him outside, it got mud, and finally I just looked at him and I said, okay, I'm going to help you leave this body. So I called Dr. Mike, and he said that he could come over on Monday night, it happened to be Martin Luther King Day. And um, we wo I woke up that morning, it was brilliantly sunny, and um, Bear Cub sat on the bed with me while I wrote, and then I carried him outside and he spent the day laying in the grass, and then I carried him inside, put him near me in the kitchen so he could watch me cook dinner one last time. And then Dr. Mike called and he said, I'll be there in about <coughs> half an hour. And I remember I had this panicky feeling. It was the same feeling I had right as I was going to the hospital to have Gabriella. I had that feeling like, oh my God, my life is going to change. I felt like I should just run away right then. I could stop it if I ran away. And instead I just stayed in the kitchen and I stood stock still. Like, I just stand here 
I'll stop time. But Mike came, Dr. Mike came, and Gabriella and I and Joe Allen were all gathered around Bear Cub. And we read something that a friend of ours had written. And then Dr. Mike explained to us that he gives him two shots. One to make him sleepy, and the second one, ten minutes later or so, to stop his heart. And he gave him the first shot, and um, Bear Cub looked up at me, and it was the same look that he gave me every time I got out of the chair. It was the look that said, is it time to go? Are we going to go for a walk? 